In the world of board game media production, one man retains the integrity and tenacity to rise above the rest and compile the definitive list of the 100 best board games of all time. And that man, that legend, is Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower. And some guy named Chaz Marlers apparently made his own top 100 list. Because Tom asked him to. No, no, I didn't. Well, hello. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here. Thank you for joining me for this, the inaugural episode of my Top 100 Board Games of All Time video series, brought to you in part by the Dice Tower and Contractual Obligation. Now, this list is going to be the Top 100 board games of mine, uh, spanning my entire life, which means it's not just going to be my favorite games as of this moment in time right now, but it's also going to include games that have had the most significant impact on my life. Saying the idea out loud now, though, it doesn't uh, sound as riveting as it did in, in my head, but, but hey, it's more work for me, so. A anyway. I know that everyone out there watching is as excited and anxious to see me rattle off an arbitrary list of board games as I am to present them. So, without any further ado, let's get started right away with number 100! Alright, I, ho I hope I'm doing this right, but uh, my number 100 is Risk. Well, you know, ho ho hold on a second now, he hear me out, he hear me out. The reason why Risk hangs on at number 100 on my list is because it's a game that has a very significant place in my history as a board gamer. Um, when I was in kindergarten, my mother and father got divorced, and when I was in first grade, uh, my mother got remarried. Um, and the only way I can really describe my stepfather is to to say you, you know that that game you play when uh you say if, hey, if someone was to play you in a movie or a tv show you know what famous actor would play you well the only people i think that could fill his role would be a combination of fred flintstone and homer simpson and i think it also helps to note that those are both cartoon characters which looking back explains a lot so, between my siblings and I, growing up, we spent most of our time either being assigned chores to do or being yelled at for arbitrary things that had happened around the house. So, the one respite in all of this turbulence was risk. This was the one activity that uh, my stepfather and I and other members of the family could engage in that didn't evolve into a big, huge family argument. Um, it distracted us all enough that we could just play the game with the TV on in the background or something and um, have a quiet evening for once. So that's why Risk, even though it's outdated and outmoded and has long since been surpassed by other games that do what Risk does far better, it'll always have this indelible place in my mind. And so that's why uh, Risk comes in at number 100. <laughs> We're off to a really good start though, huh? <laughs> yeah! <sighs> All right, okay. When I was growing up, my absolute favorite toy was G.I. Joe. I would spend not only every spare moment I had, but every spare penny from my allowance collecting every single figure and accessory and vehicle from the Hasbro G.I. Joe line. And one of my favorite G.I. Joe related activities was 1985's G.I. Joe Commando Attack board game. This thing was Fantastic! The board had to be at least four feet by four feet wide, and it had these little cardboard standees of each of the figures, but it also included these little plastic stands, so you could swap out the cardboard standees with the actual plastic figure. And guess what I ended up doing? So, in this game, each side had several cardboard 3D buildings under their control. You had a little headquarters building, and then next to that you had a little fenced-in prisoner camp, and then over on the other side you had something that I can't remember what it was. 
But what you would do is you would have your little figures go into the battlefield and take prisoners and rescue your prisoners and try to blow up the other one's headquarters. It was just a fantastic game that I remember playing over and over and over again. Cobra, to be honest, I think my nostalgic memories are probably a lot kinder to this game than actual history would have been. So it, in this case, it's probably best to leave the G.I. Joe Commando Strike game uh, in my memories and not on my shelves. But even if it's not on my shelf, it'll live on in spot number 99 on my list. All right, number 98, I think, is the last of the classic games that are on my list for a while. And this one is Stratego. Have I played any of these games? Now, the reason why Stratego is on my list is because of my daughter. Uh, she's currently nine and a half years old. And I started introducing her to games when she was like two and a half. And every few months I might introduce a, a new game to her and some of them stick and some of them don't. And about two years ago, I introduced Stratego, and it's one of them that stuck with her. Uh, she actually gets this off the shelf and asks me to play it. But the reason why Stratego earns its way onto the list is because of the way I have seen her mental faculties improve over time as we've been playing it. When we first started, I would actually just grab all my pieces out of the board at random and just set them up however they laid. No strategic game plan or anything, just where the pieces lie. And I would still beat her, you know, 90% of the time. Then I would start to win 80% of the time, then 70% of the time. But now I've moved on from just randomly setting up my pieces to putting some strategic planning into the way I do it. And I still only win about 50% of the time. So seeing her improve and her gameplay evolve over the past few months and years has really made Stratego a special experience for the two of us. And that is why it comes in at number 98 on my list. Next up on my list at number 97 is Privateer Press's Level 7 Invasion. Now, Speaking of games that can replace Risk, this is a game where you have a map of the entire world and you and your teammates each control a continent and you're trying to work together managing all of your population and resources to fight back this alien invasion that's just bombarding the entire planet. The game is ruthless, it's brutal to the players, and I really enjoy it. But every single person that I have played it with has said, this game is ruthless and brutal to the players. I hated it. So it's not for everybody. So that's why Level 7 Invasion comes in at number 97 on my list. It's a world domination, dudes on a map, cooperative game, but a really stressful one that's not for everybody. Hey, let's continue the dudes on a map discussion with Rex, Final Days of an Empire, which comes in at number 96. Now, Rex, Final Days of an Empire is a very interesting, neat game. Each player faction has its own unique asymmetrical player powers, and there's this big ship going around bombarding this city as you play, so you have to watch out for that. As you're watching out for the other players, you can make alliances, you can break alliances. Some of your opponent's leaders can actually secretly be spies working for you that can reveal right at the wrong time for them. So all of that is why this game has earned its way onto my top 100 list, but the reason why it's in the 90s is because actually um, I'm not sure I'm a huge fan of its combat system. Um, you have the power dials and you commit that many troops and you add your leaders. But there's just something about it that I can't quite put my finger on. I don't know. Maybe I want to be rolling dice and there's no dice to roll. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's something else. Also, this is one of the few games that when it's been played at my board game club, I've actually seen a couple of the players lose their cool and almost get into a real fight with each other. It didn't help, too, that the game took over four hours to play with six players, so... That's Rex, Final Days of an Empire. A really interesting, well-designed game, but one that always leaves me wanting to have had just a little bit different of an experience. 
Many people ask me if Pandemic is going to be on this list. And spoiler alert, I'm not telling you. I will tell you, however, that its distant cousin, Defenders of the Realm, will be appearing on this list at number 95. And that's why at number 95, we have Defenders of the Realm. Now this is a game that's kind of based on the Pandemic Engine, for lack of uh, actual good description. But in this game, you have all of these different heroes, each with a different ability. I mean, there's been like three or four expansions, so there's, I think, maybe 16 different heroes at this point. Uh, and each one plays a little bit different, which is great. But even with its straightforward concept, every time we play this game, uh, the, the other players and I always run into some little strange timing issue questions or game mechanism questions that we work through. But it always seems that there's more fiddliness to this game than there should be. So that's why this one lands in my 90s. I really do enjoy it, but it doesn't hit the table as often anymore uh, because it seems like every time it does, uh, about 20% of the game time is always with kind of questions coming up and, and discussion about those things. Soon, a new game, Defenders of the Last Stand, is going to be released, which is based on the similar concepts of Pandemic and Defenders of the Realm. And I'm wondering if Defenders of the Last Stand is going to just replace Defenders of the Realm completely for me. Hopefully, we'll find out really soon. But for now, Defenders of the Realm defends its position at number fun nine fun. Number 94 is the first game in kind of an ongoing theme that we're going to be seeing here, and it's games that tell a story. That's why number 94 on my list is Shoots and Ladders by Parker Brothers. Wait a minute, that, that doesn't sound right. Shoots and Ladders is way higher on this list. Number 94 on my list is Betrayal at House on the Hill. This game, for all the flaws that it has, still tells an incredible story if you play it with the right people. The games that I've played have always come down to the players not even caring anymore who wins or who loses, but everyone, good or bad, starting to work together to play the scenario to its fullest. For example, there was one time where I was playing and I became the betrayer, and at the end of the game, I just had to stop everybody from exiting the house. As floor after floor, starting from the second floor coming down, started to collapse. Room after room started to collapse. Boom, 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 boom. And some of the players were stuck upstairs. And the magic elevator was at the end of this hallway. And one of the players was taking their turns running down this hallway as fast as they possibly could to get to that elevator. And they got to the point where I was cheering them on, hoping they would get to the elevator as room after room down the hallway was just collapsing right behind them as they ran. Boom, 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 boom. And after a while, we forgot about winning or losing, and we were just telling the story of this house crumbling down around us all as this madman was downstairs trying to stop everyone, and they are trying to pass by and get out the front door before the entire house was just reduced to rubble. No, I think that was Shoots and Ladders. It was a fantastic gaming experience because it gave us all a fantastic story to tell afterwards. And that is why Betrayal at House on the Hill earns its way onto my top 100 list of all time, currently at 94. All right, but sometimes you don't want a huge, massive story to tell. You just want to sit around a table, casually being a jerk to your friends. And there's no better way to mask that ulterior motive than to play a game while you're doing it. And that's why Koo comes in at number 94, right? Note three. And that's why Koo comes in at number 93. This is a light, fast-paced card game in which you can get in each other's face, lie, sabotage, whatever you want to do with each other, and it ends before things get too heated or complicated. Of all the micro games that can come up as possible fillers at my game club between games, Koo is the one that I'm most excited to jump into whenever it hits the table. And that's why it's on my list at number 93. I like the game Samurai Sword, and I like it because I thought I would like Bang the Card Game. In fact, I purchased Bang the Card Game and all of its expansions and discovered I hate it. Samurai Sword fixes a lot of the problems I have with Bang the Card Game, and that's why Samurai Sword appears later on higher up on my list. But at number 92 is Bang the Dice Game. 
Uh, I just mentioned how Koo was a light, fun little filler. Bang the Dice Game fits that same bill. It's light, it's fun, uh, it's interactive with everybody playing around the table at the same time, and I enjoy it leaps and bounds more than Bang the Card Game. So, number 92, Bang the Dice Game. It's one of those dice games that I think far surpasses its original non-dice game version. At Dice Tower Con this year, moderator Chris from Flip the Table spent an unhealthy amount of time in my presence, as his decontamination therapy will attest to. But one of the benefits of our time together is that he and I got to discuss a lot of things Ghostbusters. In fact, we got to play a Ghostbusters game together, which was not only one of the worst Ghostbusters games I've ever had, but one of the worst games I've ever played in my life. Fortunately, he was able to then salvage my Dice Tower convention experience by introducing me to number 91 on my list, Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. This game is a reskinning of another game, whose name I will insert here, and it does Ghostbusters right. This game is simple, uh, it has that exploding bad guy mechanism like from Pandemic and similar games, and you're going in and it is a roll and move game, surprise, but this game is fun, it's surprisingly difficult, and it will sneak up and bite you just when you think you have a handle on it. So a big shout out and a word of thanks goes out to moderator Chris from Flip the Table for introducing me to number 91 on my list, Ghostbusters Protect the Barrier. And remember, in Soviet Russia, barrier protects you. <laughs> you see what I did there, Chris? Oh, I stole your thing and used it without your permission. Alrighty, that wraps up the first tenth of my list. Join me next time for games number 90 through 81. I want to know if any of the games listed so far would appear on your own top 100 games of all time list, and if so, where they would land in your own list. Let me know in the comments below. And until then, for more board game news and reviews and commentary such as this, be sure to subscribe to both the Dice Tower and the Pair of Dice Paradise YouTube channels. And be sure to follow us on Twitter and Facebook as well to continue the conversations there. Till next time, I've been Chaz Marler, and you have been watching my contractually obligated list of the top 100 board games of all time. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. I wrote my... Uh... Top 100 on these little index cards, and I almost got them out of order. I did get them out of order. Yay for me!